In this video, I'm gonna show you how you can turn this into this using Google Gemini's Nano Banano inside of Photoshop, which is brand new and it's amazing, but Photoshop is charging extra for this feature. There's always a catch, right? I love this tool so much, but I'm concerned it's not gonna be affordable. So I looked into it, I did the research, and I wanted to find out exactly how much this costs. And I'm gonna go over all those numbers with you, but first, let's see how it works. So this is our hero front of house shot, and it's a shot that I include in all of my photo shoots. And if you're just getting started, I do have a free shot list guide that I'll put in the description that will help you know what shots you need to get for every single photo shoot. So here's what we're gonna do. We're gonna grab our marquee tool. And we're gonna draw a selection around the entire image. And we're gonna hit generative fill. If you don't have this dialog box, what you wanna do is you wanna go up to window and then show contextual taskbar. So you're gonna hit generative fill, and then you're going to click on this right here, and this gives you options. And the one we're gonna choose is Gemini 2.5 Nano Banana. I actually have a prompt for this, and this is something that I sort of refined a little bit over time. It's not perfect. There's still uh, times when it gets things incorrect, but it's been working pretty well for me so far. And I will leave this in the description if you'd like to use it. So we're gonna type in the prompt and hit generate. And that's our final render. So what I like to do when I get photos like this or when I put together photos like this is you have to look from edge to edge on all of the image because the AI has a tendency to add things that aren't <laughs> really there. Um, so it's very important to make sure that you look over the entire image very carefully. So I think that this light is actually not there. Yeah. I don't really care that it's shifting it over a little bit. That doesn't change the image structurally, but this does, this light. So that's not something that I want. So I'm going to try it again. Select it again. And it looks like that time, I think it got it right. We don't have any extra lighting or anything like that. The thing that's so amazing about this is when you look at the house right here, look at the hard shadows right here. Look at the hard shadows over here. I have used an editor to try to create virtual twilights and there is zero chance that they can make this look as clean as this is making it because it's recreating the image. So again, I would look over this entire image, but this looks pretty good to me. So let's try it on another image. Same thing here. What we're looking for is for it to get rid of the hard shadows, get rid of the shadows from the sun, and then just make it more like a sunset or twilight photo. This looks so amazing to me. All those hard shadows are gone. Hard shadows are gone right here. However, we have <laughs> extra light fixtures right there. I've done this photo several times just because I've been trying to test you know, this feature. Um, and this photo seems to struggle a bit. So let's try one more time. So this one did a pretty good job. Just got that one light fixture here. So a lot, a lot of times what I'll do is I'll go in and once I get something that I think is really, really close. I may go in and try to touch it up myself. So for that, I'm just going to hit command option, alt, command option, shift E or command alt shift E, which creates a, a stamp layer. And I'm going to go up here and see if I can get rid of this light fixture. And the uh, letters are off here. So I may try to see if I can actually grab those and bring those in. So I'm going to go into that layer and I'm going to hit command J. I'm going to bring those up here. Let me hide that for one second. So I'm going to get rid of these. And then I'm going to try to see if I can get rid of that color cast by doing a hue and saturation layer. 
and grabbing this color picker. And it's basically what I'm going to do is an eyedropper tool and I'm going to click and drag down the saturation. And what that does is it brings down the saturation for that color for the entire image. But if you want it just to affect just that part of the image, then what you want to do is take the mask and invert it by hitting, hitting command I, and then use your brush with uh, white selected to brush back in just that area. So something like that. And then another thing I'll do is sort of like a dodge and burn, but this is a little bit different. I, what I'll do is I create a new layer and I'll go to soft light and I'll, I'll change my brush opacity to 11% and the flow to 30%. And this is sort of, again, like sort of like a dodge and burn. I'll go black and white wherever I need it. So black will be like my burning. And white, I'll hit X to make the brush white now for areas that I want to brighten up just a little bit. Go back to X to darken that a little bit. Just sort of trying to make the exposure more even right here. And once I get it kind of where I want it to be, then I'll make another new stamp layer by, again, hitting Command, Option, Shift, E. And now I'll use my uh, Remove tool to sort of select here. Now that it's close, it's probably going to try to match what I've done here. And that's going to get me pretty close to where I want to be. And then I'm going to try to bring in my, my numbers. I'm going to move those to where they should be. Let's see where it's supposed to be. Maybe a little bit lower right there. And then what I'm going to do is I'm going to create another adjustment layer and click on brightness. And what I'm going to, I only want the brightness to affect the number layer. So what I'll do is I'll click on this and it will only affect the layer below it. I want to get it pretty close. Another stamp layer. If I'm being really, really picky, I may go in here and try to clean up the edges. So right now I'm looking at this at 400%. If you're looking at this at 100%, this is going to go on the MLS. So most people aren't really going to notice anything like that. Just a little more cleanup. And if I'm being super picky, this looks like a little bit over sharpened for this area. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to blur just that area. just a little bit. And then I'm going to create a mask so that I can brush that in just a little bit. A little more hue and saturation to even it up. And that's probably what I would end up with my final image. It's a little bit overkill on the edit. I don't think anyone's going to notice. It's going to end up on Zillow. Zillow is going to compress that file, but you get the idea. So what's the actual cost of this? Well, it kind of depends on the plan. Well, not kind of. It does depend on the plan that you have. The way Adobe structures it is by generative credits. And for one of these instances or renders, it costs 10 credits. But what does that actually amount to in terms of cost to you? If you have the full Creative Cloud plan that includes all of Adobe software, that costs $69.99 a month. 
you'll get 4,000 credits per month, which means you could potentially make like 400 of these, except of course that the number drops when it doesn't create it, the image perfectly or correctly. But what if you don't wanna pay for the full Creative Cloud plan? Maybe you just want Photoshop and Lightroom bundle, which is personally what I would recommend. That bundle costs $19.99 per month, but it only gives you 25 generative credits, which kind of sucks. But you can purchase credits separately. So for an extra $10 a month, you can get 2,000 credits. And that would give you a potential 200 renders, give or take how many mistakes it might make. So honestly, I could sit here and try to do the math on, you know, justifying whether or not that's going to work out in terms of profitability, but it's pretty simple. It's $10 for the extra credits. You only have to sell one virtual Twilight per month in order for it to be profitable pretty straightforward. Honestly, I was almost tempted to even just start including them for free to clients. It was something I was really thinking about as like a value add for my clients. But the problem is that it does make mistakes. And the amount of times I, I the amount of time that I have to spend editing and correcting things is something that I have to account for. And there's one other thing that is kind of important. And that is that when you are creating these renders, it's actually creating a copy of the image. It's not uh, photoshopping the image, it's recreating the image from scratch. So technically it's not your image anymore. So it kind of gets to that whole thing of it's like, is this a copyright issue? And is it an issue for the MLS where these photos go? And is there any chance like I could be held liable for something? I don't know. I'm not a lawyer and I can't give any lawyerly advice. You definitely need to do your own research, but I can tell you what I'm going to do. And that is to put a watermark on each one of these images that says it was created using AI. And I think that as long as I have that disclaimer there, I feel like I'm covered. Lastly, I want to mention again that if you're just getting started in real estate photography or this is something that interests you as a, a possible career and you need a shot list guide, I definitely know that I needed one when I first started. I have a free one on my site and I'll leave a link in the description or you can comment the words shot list and I'll send it right over to you. And if you want to get started in real estate video, which I, I recommend that you do, you're definitely going to want to watch this video right here.